بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم this is the first lecture on complexity analysis so we are referring to this book for Adam Drozdek and today we are going to cover the basics of the um, complexity analysis framework so how do we measure efficiency now this is an important question when we are talking about algorithms we usually have multiple algorithms for the same problem and we would like to compare them based on efficiency so we can choose the most efficient now efficiency can be measured in regard of time which is the time it takes the algorithm to fully execute and it can be also measured in terms of space, which is the amount of memory, uh, primary or secondary, that the algorithm will use. For this course, you will focus on time efficiency mainly. Now, we can measure the time taken by an algorithm in milli or microseconds. Uh, many programming languages offer utilities to measure the execution time. This is easy to find, however, it is highly dependent, dependent uh, it highly depends on the hardware and the operating system, programming languages, and other factors. Now, so this uh, you can say is very subjective. It is di uh, different in some cases than others. So you cannot um, basically compare different algorithms using this measures. Now, instead of this measure, we will count the number of basic operation. So for any algorithm, there are many operations and we will do a simple counting for the basic operation. Now, what is a basic operation? We will see in few slides. Now, we will use some logical units to express the relationship uh, in the efficiency equation. So we will refer to the size of the input by n so we will whenever we say n we usually mean uh, an array size and we will refer to the time it is uh, required by the algorithm to process to process this input that would be t now this is a mathematical function t of n which is basically the amount of time taken by the algorithm to process an input of size n so I mentioned earlier um, counting basic operations. What are the basic operations? We have many examples of basic operations here. We start with arithmetic operations, so multiplication, division, modulo, addition, and subtraction. We have the Boolean operations that you will find usually in a condition. You have a assignment statement, um, reading or writing primitive types, conditional test, um, like an if statement or a loop. We have also method calls. Now, we just mean here the method call, not the entire method execution, because the method execution must be, or the time taken by the method to execute must be um, calculated independently. Uh, also, we have memory access, which is uh, when usually when you index an array, uh, that will be a memory access to extract a specific element. Uh, a final note is that plus plus and plus equal or multiply equal are considered two basic operation because, for example, in plus plus, we are incrementing the variable by one and we are assigning the new value to same variable. So we have an example here of counting the basic operation. We have a simple assignment in the beginning, so that's one. Then we have for loop. Now, we know that from the condition here and the initialization step, this for loop will take or will be executed five times. So the statement inside the loop is two basic operations. We have addition right here and we have assignment. Now, these two operations will be repeated five times. So it's five by two. And regarding the header of the loop, we have a simple initialization here, assignment. That's one operation and we have the condition. The condition will be executed five times. That will be true because we said the loop will execute five times and each time the body of the loop is executed, that means the condition was true. So we have five tests for the condition that will give us true and the six times um, the test will give us false. So we will stop the loop 
So in total, the condition is executed six times. We have here two operations, as we mentioned before. We have the incrementation and the assignment after incrementing. Now this will be repeated how many times? We will execute it five times because we don't execute it in the beginning of the loop. In the beginning, we just execute the initialization step and we execute it one final time when we have the condition to be false, right? So this is the total operation for the header. We have one for initialization, six for the condition and five times two for the incrementation step. For the body of the loop, we have it's five times two because we have two operations right here. And finally, the return statement is just one basic operation. So if you sum up these numbers, you will end up with 29 operation. Now, obviously this piece of code here does not depend on any variable size input. So there is no N. It's, it will always take the same amount of time. So T of N is just equal to 29, independent of N. And in this situation, when T of N is just equal to a constant C, um, we say that T of N equal to C generally, regardless of what is the value of C. So one problem with this approach is counting the exact number of operation is cumbersome and sometimes it's impossible. So we can focus our attention on asymptotic complexity. Now, what do we mean by asymptotic complexity? We will see. Now, we if we express the amount of time required by an algorithm by a polynomial function or by any function, um, as a matter of fact, like this one here, where we have n squared plus 100n plus log base 10 of n plus 1,000, now, this is a function that represents the amount of time if we have an input of size n, okay? So to get the exact amount of time, we will just substitute the input size, the array size, for example. Now, what we mean by asymptotic complexity is we will approximate this function right here by the highest order term. So we will discard lower order terms. So here the highest order terms is n square. So we will say that Tn is approximately equal to n square. We will basically remove anything that is lower than n square in terms of the ordinal. So this is roughly what we mean by asymptotic complexity. It's an approximation by only considering the highest order term. So why does this make sense? And so let's take um, some concrete numbers as examples. So if we consider n to range from one to 100,000, now these are just different values for the input size, and we will evaluate if n, or this must be, or yeah, this is just the same as t of n from the previous slide, which is written down here. So if you evaluate this entire function using this value of n, we will get these numbers. Now let's see what is the value for individual terms. So for n squared, for example, when n is one, n squared is just one, when n is 10, n squared is 100 and so on. We will do the same for 100 n. So we will evaluate the value of this term when for different value of n and same thing for log 10 of n and 1000. Of course, 1000 does not depend on n. So the value of 1000 is just always thousand. Now what we will do as well is we will calculate what is the percentage of this number right here, the value of n square compared to the entire function value. So one is the number one right here is just 0.1 percent of a thousand hundred and one. Same thing for a hundred. So the hundred right here represent just around 5% of the function value, the entire function value. And as we increase the value of n, we see that the value of n square actually represent 99% of the function value. So the value of this represent almost the entire function value and the contribution of other terms is very minimal as we increase n. 
So this is why it makes sense to approximate f of n with n square, especially when we only care about the situation when n is quite large. So that's it for this lesson, and I will see you on the next one.